Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this study of the book of Genesis. Today is Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. This is episode number 14, and we are continuing today in our following of the life of Noah, the story of Noah building the ark, the story of the world being absolutely corrupt, and God's plan to actually destroy the world. Today we're going to look at the first half of chapter 7, so let's dive right into this and continue, continue following the story of Noah this morning. Well, let's dive right into this, starting in chapter 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before men in this generation. So the first thing I want to point out to you is that God says to Moses, or to, I'm sorry, to Noah, he says, Come into the ark, you and all your household. Now, I want you to notice here that he did not say, go into the ark he said come into the ark now the implication of that is that god was there with him and he was inviting him to come in and be in his presence in order to be protected from the wrath of 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 god that was going to come upon the world charles spurgeon said it this way notice that the lord did not say to noah go into the ark but come plainly implying that god was himself in the ark waiting to receive Noah and his family into the big ship that was uh, that was really to be their place of refuge while all other people on the face of the earth were to be drowned. Now that is the same invitation that we receive from God today. Uh, come into that relationship with Jesus. Come into the ark of Jesus that you will be saved from the, you, you'll have refuge. It's a place of refuge from the destruction and the wrath that is going to come upon all the people of the world. And so still that invitation is welcome and open today that you can come into God. You can come into that relationship with Jesus. In him you find refuge and redemption for your soul. He is the rescue of the wrath of God that will come. Unless you find yourself in God, in Christ, uh, when you die, you will be forever lost and you will be forever sent to uh, punishment. There will be a forever period of punishment that you will go through unless you are willingly accepting of Christ and you come into the refuge, you come into the ark that he is going to offer you. Now he says to Noah, I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And so I want you to note this word. He says, I have seen that you are righteous before me. You are righteous before me in this generation. Now, what was the generation of Noah? What was that being known for? Well, we've talked about that before. In this generation, we saw a great population explosion. So the population was growing immensely during the time of Noah. We saw that it was full of, of uh, it says, every intent of the heart uh, and, the, and the thoughts is evil. So there was an evil intent in people. We saw that there was incredible sexual perversion that was going on. So the sexual perversion was happening during that time. We saw that the whole world was corrupt and that violence had spread over all of the earth. And so these things that were going on in the days of Noah, that was in this generation. And God says to him, I have seen that in this generation you are righteous. Now we can parallel that with the generation that we are in today. In the generation of today, there is an increasing uh, population, a population explosion. There's evil intent of the heart of people. Corruption and violence has spread all over the world. There is sexual perversion everywhere we look, and it's being thrown into our faces continuously um, more than ever before in our lifetimes. And God is saying, can I see in you that you are righteous in this generation in which you live in the same way that Noah was righteous in the generation in which he lived. Now, what made what made Noah righteous? What did God see in him that made him righteous? Well, that's everything that we saw in chapter 6. In chapter 6, we saw things like this. Uh, in verse 8, we saw, uh, and this is again of chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 8, we saw that Noah, um, it said that he found grace he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So we have to find grace in God. Uh, grace is not earned. Grace is not something that you can work toward. Grace is the unmerited favor and gift of God. It is the love of God. It is the empowerment of God. It is the blessing of God. It is the reaching out of God. We don't earn God's grace. We find God's grace because of that relationship with Jesus. So have you found the grace of God? Uh, it says in verses 9 and 10, it said that Noah was a just man. He was perfect in all his generations. So Noah was just, and we can even, um, 
think about for ourselves what makes us just, what makes us uh, perfect in all of our generations. Again, that is that relationship with Jesus. You can't make yourself perfect. You can't do enough good. You can't do enough um, good deeds and, and act right enough in order for God to be okay with you. There's only one way. There's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved. And that is we find just ourselves being just, made just, made righteous in the eyes of God through that relationship with Jesus. We also saw in verse 22 of chapter 6 that we saw incredible obedience because it says in that in that verse, chapter uh, 6, verse 22, thus Noah did according to all that the Lord God had commanded him. So we saw incredible obedience. So here's what you have in Noah. He found grace. He was just, or we could put in there righteous. And he was obedient. He did whatever God said. Well, that's the same thing that God is looking for in us. These are the things, then, that God saw. I have seen these in you, that you're righteous, because I saw that you were you were just, you were righteous. Now, um, it also says, and this is one of the key words, uh, it also says in verse, I think it's verse 10, that Noah then also walked with God. So think of all of those things. In this generation in which he lived, Noah was unique because he walked with God. He found grace in the eyes of God. He was just and righteous before God, and he was obedient toward God. And that's what makes us just and righteous in our generation. This is what God will look at and say, I have seen in you that you are, because you don't participate in the world. You, don't, you may live in the world, but you're not of the world. You walk with me. You're obedient toward me. You're righteous in my eyes. You have found favor and grace in my eyes. And that is all through Jesus. We find that through Jesus himself. And that's what makes us just. That's what God looks at and says, I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. We live in a generation that parallels the generation of the time of Noah. Unlike any other time in history, our generation parallels the generation of the time of Noah. Noah was righteous before God, and God saw that. And we can be righteous before God, and God will see that, not based upon our own works, but be based upon being found in Christ. And a desire that we have, that we don't want to participate with the world. We want to be different. My concern for people is the fact that they want to come to Christ, but they don't want to be different than the world. When you come to Christ, you have to be different from the world because God changes you and it makes you different from the world. His righteousness is imparted to you. It is imputed um, uh, on you. It's, it's put in your heart and it's, it becomes the covering uh, for your life. That's what the righteousness is. We are in the righteousness. We have the righteousness. We've received the righteousness of Christ and we want to be different and we want to walk different. And I don't want to be the same person I always was. I want to be someone that God is pleased with, and I want to walk with God and obey him and be obedient toward him. Now, again, we are we don't have to go crazy in this because we are still living in the world, but we have to realize that we, again, are not of the world. The world is not our home. We are in Christ. We find ourselves in Christ. We want to be in Christ. We want to walk with Christ. We want to be obedient, finding his grace, being just, being righteousness, doing all that he has said that he wants us to do. Well, this story is going to continue on with this destruction that God is going to have toward the world. So let's look at this. Well, now God is going to tell Noah exactly what he wants him to do. Here's what he's going to say. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Now, we're not going to go into the story of what is clean and what is unclean. We'll go through that further as we get through maybe other books of the Pentateuch. Um, but just suffice it to say, we have seven each of the clean, two each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female for each one, also seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. So, the only ones that would survive ultimately are the ones that are in the ark. The ark is that picture of protection. It is the picture of God's presence where God says, come into this. This is, I'm here with you. Uh, this is the protection that God provides. You step into the ark, the place of refuge, the place of freedom and safety and redemption. All of those things happen in this ark. And that is the same with Jesus today. 
you step into the ark of Jesus and you will be saved and you will be protected. Now, God says, and he starts it off right here at the very beginning. He says, you shall, I want you to take with you. Now, some wonder how the animals came to Noah uh, or how Noah got them. Uh, Genesis 6.20, it tells us exactly what would happen because in Genesis 6.20, God said to the animals that they would come to Noah. Now, think about Think about the migration patterns of animals, that they have built within them the ability to migrate at the right times the when they are supposed to. God has put in them this incredible migratory instinct, and he could, I'm sure, turn it off and on any time that he wants to, and he could have easily, it would have not even been difficult for God to miraculously provide or place within these animals an urge to migrate to the ark. Each pair of animals, uh, he planned to be really the animals that he planned to be preserved on that ark. It was not a problem for God. He would uh, turn on that migratory instinct and they would immediately go right to this place. Charles Spurgeon said this, this largest and most complete menagerie that was ever gathered together was not collected by human skill. Divine power alone could have accomplished such a task. So they went into this ark two by two. Uh, God never has a problem getting the animals to do what he wants to do. It's only man that God really has a problem with. He never has a problem with the animals. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, uh, it says, the ox knows its owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. So God has more of a problem with the people and humanity than he does with the animals. So it would have not been a problem for God to bring those animals onto the ark that he wanted to have saved. Now, last time we looked at how many animals this would be, and this would be in the um, in, in the several thousands of animals that this ark would have been able to hold. So this was not a difficult process for God. He had had them prepared ahead of time. They had the food prepared ahead of time. God provided everything that they needed. He put the migratory instinct into the animals to make their way there because God said he would do this. He would make them come to the ark. And then it was plenty enough space for them to load in and be saved uh, during this time that they were going to be there. So God is able to do beyond anything that we can understand, think, or uh, plan in our own lives. And Noah did, according to all the Lord commanded him. Now this is that, that point of why was Noah a righteous man? Why was Noah walking with God and doing what God had said? Well, here's the example. Noah, he did, according to all the Lord commanded him. He had been in the preparation stage for 100 years, and Noah did exactly what God told him to do. He's going to have to wait another week. Another week it's going to happen, but he had had 100 years of preparation during this time. But Noah, in this process, did all that God had told him to do, and this is what God is after. He is after our obedience. Will you do what I tell you to do? Will you follow and listen to my voice. His word is full of his instructions. His word gives us what he wants us to obey, and he expects us to do according to what he has said, not to disregard and, and not listen to, but he wants us to do all that he has said. Well, all of this happened at the time that Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. Again, just think about those numbers, 600 years old. Uh, people at that time prior to the flood lived extreme amounts of time, close to a thousand years uh, per person. They were living this amount of time where it's hard for us to fathom because in our lives, it's 80, 90, 100 years at the outset is about what people live. But in the time of Noah, 600 was nothing. 600 was still uh, middle-aged at the time of Noah. This is why the population uh, could have exploded so rapidly and so greatly because you have people living and not dying and having children and children and children and children. You have lots of children being born and people are living extreme amounts of time during that time. So that's why they saw this population and into the estimates of at least a billion, perhaps billions of people that would have been alive at that time. So I'm excited someday in heaven to learn about what this was like in a more detail because I think we only get a little bit of a glimpse as we read through the book of Genesis. Well, 
Noah with his his sons, his wife and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two, they went into the ark, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So all of these things happen according to God's command, and this is just the fulfillment of what God had said to do. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain on the earth, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And so what's going, what, what's happening here? Well, after the seven days of the final seven days of the waiting, at the exact right time, in the 600th year of his life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, by the way, where do you think those numbers came from? Well, it probably came from one of the survivors on the ark who had probably written, uh, would have written down the, the details, took notes, and probably Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, was using the notes of these generations in order to write the account of what happened during the time of the Genesis. So we have survivors that would have passed down, survivors that would have known the story of Adam and Eve, who would have known the story of of the early days of creation, known the story of those thousand years, what, what was going on between creation and the time of Noah. They would have known the exact date of when Noah's life would have um of when the flood would have happened because it's the 600th year of his life. It was in the second month. It was the 17th day. These are the dates that it happened. And so there was a reason that some of these details are used. At that time, the waters below were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Now remember Genesis 1-7, that there was a great water vapor barrier above the earth, above the firmament. So there was in the atmosphere a great water vapor barrier that would have allowed the people to live the length of time that they lived, that would have allowed a tropical effect upon the world worldwide. That broke open. So this water vapor was unleashed and it just released and it came in the form of rain and it was unlike anything the world had seen. This is not this is not a pocket of rain that would be a storm that would pass in one area. This would have been the entire uh, water vapor around the entire globe that would have been released. Now that amount of water, along with the waters that were coming up from below. So there would have been waters below the surface of the earth that would have been maybe released by earthquakes or some, some uh, extreme event like that. Those waters being released, the water vapor being released above, and that amount of water across the entire globe for 40 days and 40 nights would have drastically changed everything that we see. I even find myself driving through more remote parts of the country, and I look at the landscape, and I just even picture in my mind, and, and I could even see it in the landscapes, how water could have created this. So think of think of the destructive power and the reforming power of what water would have had in that amount of time. It would have been a colossal uh, catastrophe on a geological scale. And so it would have reshaped the world as we know it. And that's, we know the results today of this incredible flood that would have happened. You also have the plant life, the animal life, the human life that would have been populating the earth in the billions of numbers, potentially, the tropical life, the plant life, and the, um, and the animal life. And that amount of of biological matter trapped under all of the all of the um, uh, changing landscape, all of the water and the the movement of, of of dirt and rock and all of that compression would have happened, and that would have caused the coal and oil seams that we have in the world today. It would have been a, a ge geological catastrophe that would have happened that would have immensely changed the world. If you're interested in those kind of things. You can do research on what the creation event would have looked like potentially and what the results of the flood would have looked like. There's an incredible scientist that will study this, going through some of these things that are very, very knowledgeable. And I would encourage you to do some research on your own because incredible things that would have happened in the in the flood event itself. Now, it's interesting that it happened for 40 days and 40 nights. And the reason that's interesting is because the number 40 
has always been associated with testing and purification, especially as it's seen before entering into something new and significant. It was seen in Moses' time on Mount Sinai. He was there 40 days, 40 nights. The spies' trip to Canaan was associated with 40 days and 40 nights. Israel's time in the wilderness before they would wander, their time in the wilderness was 40 days and 40 nights. And then it would became uh, much longer than that. Uh, you had uh, Elijah's miraculous journey and then Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. All of these are associated with this idea of 40 and it always is a precursor to something that is new and significant that is about to happen. Well, with that, all entered into the ark and then the door was shut. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, and, and what was that day? Well, we know it was the 600th year. We know it was the second month, the 17th day. On that day, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and their three wives, and his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird and after its kind, every bird of every sort, and they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all the flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female, of all the flesh went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So they went in as God commanded. Again, it describes how everything was fulfilled exactly as the Lord had spoken. This was all God's promise and God's plan, and it was fulfilled the way that God said and established. In the same way, the end of the world, the end of time, the wrath of God to come, the return of the Lord will be fulfilled exactly as how God has said, and we'll be able to someday have note of that, that it all happened exactly as God had said. This is all God's plan. And he had spoken about this flood, this destruction, and he had given them warning. He had given the people ample warning to make sure that they were right, to make sure that they were prepared, but they did not heed the warning that was given except for Noah, Noah's sons, Noah's wives, and their children. And they were prepared and went into the ark and the door was shut after him. Now, Noah did not have to shut the door um, on anyone's salvation. God did it. God shut the door. He said, it is done. After the same pattern, it is never our job to disqualify people from salvation. If the door is to be shut, let God shut the door. God will at some point shut the door and say, it is done. It is no more of a possibility. God kept the door open until the last possible minute, but there came a time that the door had to be shut. When the door is open, it is open, but when it is shut, it's shut. Jesus is he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens, Revelation 3.7. Uh, 3, the ark was the salvation picture for Noah and it was the picture of condemnation for the world. There is no second chance to those who are left out. Jesus is the ark to the world, but once that door is shut, there is no second chance for those who are left out. Well, Let's finish it with a couple, with one more verse. Now the flood was on the earth for 40 days. And that's where we're going to end it today. And we're going to look at the rest of the flood's description as we get through the rest of chapter 7 next time. We'll look at Noah in the ark during the flood for the next account. But God had done exactly what he had promised that he would do. And he gave them 100 and years so so think about this. There were, for Noah and his people, there were 100 years of warning. 100 years that God had said, in this amount of time, this is when the wrath will come. This is when destruction is going to come. This is when all who will be outside, really, of the ark are going to perish. But he had given them ample warning. In the same way today, God has given the people of the world ample warning. He has given them his word. He has given them his son. He has said, this is when we, this will happen. He has said, here are the signs that you need to look for. Here are the things that are going to go on. He's given those signs in things like the books of Daniel, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, 
He's given examples and signs in some of the minor prophets. He has given the examples and the signs in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and in the book of Luke. He's given examples and signs in the book of Revelation. He has told us that this is the things to look for. This is the warning time that God has given us, but people will not pay attention. And at some point, at some point, the door will be shut. And once the door is shut, it is too late for mankind. Once the door is shut, it is over, and there will be no more opportunity that people have in order to repent. I believe in the days of Noah that Noah probably was warning his friends and people he knew. He probably lived in a neighborhood. He probably had uh, people around him that he knew, and he was probably warning them, but they would not heed his warning. They thought, this is just a crazy God follower. This is not true. It can't possibly be true. This would not possibly happen. And all of a sudden, it was too late as soon as that door was shut. We have time today to warn people before the door is shut, before it is too late. We have friends and loved ones that we need to be warning before the time of the end comes, before the door is shut. Make sure that you are praying for, loving on, speaking to, and giving the opportunity for people to come to Christ before it is too late. Be planting seeds in people's hearts and in people's lives by the way that you live life and the interactions that you have with them, hoping that some will come to repentance, that some will know Jesus, and some will decide to follow him before the door is shut, before it is too late, before the flood that happens on the earth for 40 days. Now, the, there's not going to be a flood this time. This time, it is going to be with a sword. It's going to be the wrath of God that is going to come. By the way, if you want to learn more about that, help, follow along with me in our study of prophecy end times in the book of Revelation that comes out every Sunday afternoon. Well, thanks for joining me today. Next time we'll look at Noah and his family on the